Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If music is a priority in your life, you're going to want to subscribe below, be a part of this community, hit the bell so you never miss out on our daily content. We'd love to have you. Also, for more uh, content, behind the scenes footage, interviews, mini documentaries, check us out on Patreon. You can do so at the link below. It's time for another episode of our series, Vox, where we celebrate the greatest vocalists of the rock era. On this episode of Vox, we pay tribute to the incomparable David Gilmour. Now, we can't mention the name David Gilmour without marveling over his incredible skill as a guitarist. I mean, especially his peerless mastery of string bending. He is unquestionably one of the most talented and influential players in rock history. And we'll point out some specific highlights of his brilliant guitar work later in this piece, but really, this episode specifically recognizes David Gilmour's electrifying vocal prowess. Distinctive, penetrating, and majestic. The music of Pink Floyd has the notoriety of being classified as stoner music. But you don't need THC to experience a blissful, psychoactive high when listening to the voice of David Gilmour singing one of um, innumerable Pink Floyd classics. I mean, David Gilmour's voice is an organic, over-the-counter drug that stimulates the brain. It's such a vital part of the Pink Floyd mystique. Now, David Gilmour grew up in the Cambridge area of England. His father was an educator and lecturer, and his mother a teacher and film editor for the BBC. David's parents encouraged their son to study music, but young David did so at his own pace. I mean, he was inspired early on by there was Elvis and Everly Brothers. Albert King was a huge influence on the way that Gilmour perfected his craft as a budding guitarist. Now, in the mid-60s, Gilmour began busking around Spain and France with Sid Barrett, his schoolboy chum he met at Perth School in Cambridge. Now, it was a bleak time where both Gilmour and Barrett were arrested on more than one occasion for vagrancy, and Gilmour had to be hospitalized for malnutrition. In 1967, Gilmore teamed with Rick Wills and Willie Wilson to form a band they called Flowers, then changed the name to Bullet. Later in 1967, Gilmore provided the lead vocal on two songs for a Bridget Bardo drama, titled Two Weeks in September. While still a member of Bullet in 67, Gilmore went to a Pink Floyd concert and he watched the band play See Emily Play. When he approached his friend Sid Barrett after this performance, uh, he was taken aback when Barrett uh, didn't recognize him. At that point, David Gilmour had known Barrett for nearly nine years. I mean, imagine how shocked you would be if someone that you pretty much lived on the street with for months and had known since middle school didn't remember you. Sadly, Barrett was only 21 when this happened. It was obviously a sign of Barrett's serious mental health issues, suffering from um, invasive schizophrenia and catatonia. Bullet was also disintegrating, and the band was so broke that they actually ran out of gas on their way to a gig. They had no money to buy fuel, and they had to push their bus off of a ferry transport and abandon it. In late 67, it was drummer Nick Mason that invited Gilmore to join Pink Floyd to fill in for Sid Barrett, whose behavior had become uh, far too erratic for the band's stomach. The original plan was for Gilmore to front the band as lead guitarist and lead vocalist while Barrett would continue to be involved behind the scenes, primarily as a writer. Barrett's antics proved to be far too detrimental for the band, so he volunteered to leave Pink Floyd in 1968. Uh, despite the difficulty of working with Sid Barrett, the original band members and Gilmore often reflected back on their days with Sid with reverence for his talent, incredible talent, and mourned his gradual demise. The album, A Saucer Full of Secrets, the band's second LP, was the first album uh, that included David Gilmore. And, of course, the beginning of unimaginable artistic consequence and success for the once destitute street musician David Gilmore and Pink Floyd were inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 96, and then the UK Music Hall of Fame in 2005. In 2003, Gilmore was given the prestigious honor of Commander of the Order of the British Empire, otherwise known by its acronym, the CBE. 
He, of course, is a dedicated activist for animal rights, environmentalism, homelessness, and human rights. He's also an experienced pilot and the father of eight children. Having said that, here is my David Gilmore Fiverr. Of course, this is such a big subject, we'll cover a lot more about David Gilmore in the future. But uh, first of all, an honorable mention for High Hopes from the 94 Pink Floyd album, The Division Bell. High Hopes presents a warm-hearted retrospective vocal by David that demonstrates the purity and natural serenity of his unmistakable voice. Dragged by the force of some in a tide. Co-written by David and his wife, Polly Sampson. Man, I remember waiting so long for the Division Bell to come out as a, as a, in high school. I just loved it. It's no wonder that High Hopes is one of David Gilmore's favorite songs in the rich Pink Floyd discography. It's such a great one. Number five, from the groundbreaking 1979 Pink Floyd double LP, The Wall, Young Lust. Now, Empty Space is the preceding track on side two of The Wall ends abruptly, leading immediately into the jolting cold intro of Young Lust. Uh, this is just an arresting David Gilmore vocal filled with intensity of angst and bravado. Stranger in this town? Where are all the good times? Who's going to show this stranger around? Gilmore exudes the theme of this song so perfectly. You can feel the frustration of unfulfilled sexual desire from the rock and roll refugee who wants to feel like a real man. Where are all the, good times? the bold opening declaration of Young Lust was not on the original demo of the tune, but after several rewrites and shifts on the arrangement, the final version found on the wall was brilliantly engineered by James Guthrie and produced by Bob Ezrin. Young Lust was co-written by Gilmore and Waters, who was the principal composer for most of the material on the wall since the concept for the album originated from autobiographical material Waters had scripted that was uh, of a mixture of his own life and the life of troubled aforementioned Pink Floyd co-founder Sid Barrett. The long distance collect phone call at the end of this song is the real deal. While the album was being recorded in LA, co-producer James Guthrie arranged to place an international collect phone call to his friend Chris Fitzmorris in London with an actual long distance operator on the line. For the recording of the stage collect call from Mr. Floyd to Mrs. Floyd, they used the exchange with the second operator that they got on the line because the operator on the first attempt eh, was too bland and didn't give them the desired effect that they were looking for. Um, they wanted the phone call to have authenticity. Subsequently, the operator was not notified that she was being recorded. States calling our that recording stunt was a very cool way to end Young Lust and transition into the next track on the album. Number four, Dogs. Man, David Gilmore performs an amazing lead vocal on the first half of the 17 minute rock you drama about the predatory nature of man found on the 77 Pink Floyd album, Animals. Gilmore and Waters co-authored the track, uh, of course borrowing from George Orwell's concept of human behavior mirroring the behavior of animals. There is no puppy love in Pink Floyd's dogs, only biting, cold, hard truth. On Dogs, Gilmore sings about the ruthless way that man is taught to succeed in business and eliminate his competitors. You have to be trusted by the people that you lie to so that when they turn their backs on you, you'll get the chance to put the knife in. It's the bitter realism in Gilmore's performance that makes the vocal on Dogs just so compelling. You gotta sleep on your toes, and when you're on the street, you gotta be able to pick out the easy meat with your eyes closed. You got to be able to pick out the easy meat with your eyes closed. Kidding me? Gilmore's delivery is honest, yet despondent, and almost apologetic. Where does a cold-hearted dog-eat-dog -dog life ultimately get you? As Gilmore imparts in verse two of Dogs, just another sad old man, all alone, and dying of cancer. Brilliant. Sad old man, all alone, Number three, Wish You Were Here. David Gilmour's vocals on Roger Waters' song, based on a poem he wrote about Sid Barrett's spiral into madness. 
The tune was a rare occasion where Gilmore and Waters collaborated on writing the song together. It was a mutual homage to Sid by the entire band, really. I wish you were here stemmed from that famous opening riff. Of course, that Gilmore was playing at a fast tempo in the studio. When Waters heard Gilmore playing that riff, he suggested that he slow the tempo, creating a distant thought or a reflection of something that happened long ago. It worked so brilliantly. Gilmore called the final slower version of Wish You Were Here a very simple country song. The first two verses of Wish You Were Here showcase the purity of David Gilmore's resonance, perhaps better than any other of his countless vocal thrills. You can tell. So you think you can tell heaven from hell, blue skies from pain? Can you tell a green field from a cold still rail? A smile from a veil, do you think you can tell? To further compliment David Gilmore's amazing performance on Wish You Were Here, it's cool to note that Gilmore himself refers to the track as one of Pink Floyd's best songs. Number two, money. From one of the all-time best-selling albums ever, Pink Floyd's groundbreaking Dark Side of the Moon. We talked about it with Alan Parsons a few weeks ago. Money features David Gilmore's insightful interpretation of the brilliant composition by Roger Waters. There's like a spiteful contempt in Gilmore's vocal tone about the world's obsession with wealth and the hypocrisy of materialists uh, disguised as philanthropists. It's Gilmore's attitude that gives the song the stick it to the man rock integrity. One of the elements that makes Money such a timeless masterpiece. Money stands out sonically for its unique time structure and its change-ups. Gilmore expanded on the original 7-8 riff that Roger Waters created for Money, changing the cadence to 7-4 and adding a 4-4 progression for the first guitar solo. Gilmore takes the concept of a guitar solo to a whole new level, unleashing three divergent guitar solos on money. The first two were performed on a Fender Stratocaster, the Black Strat, and the last solo course came from Gilmore playing on a custom-made Bill Lewis guitar. The second solo by Gilmore is performed dry and empty, with the production effects such as reverb turned off giving that section an unplugged feel as if there are four musicians just jamming in a small room. The energy of the song rises on the third solo with the dramatic return of reverb and echo along with added rhythm guitar and bigger percussion. The tenor sax solo by David Perry. followed by Gilmore's guitar. First solo is a vicious musical attack on the senses. The production is dynamic and cinematic. The reason Dark Side of the Moon is just one of the most riveting listening experiences ever recorded. On the subject of money, it can be used for something other than evil. In 2019, David Gilmore sold 123 of his famous guitars, including the black strap that he played on money, and other cuts on Dark Side of the Moon in an auction for Client Earth, a charity to combat climate change. The auction of Gilmore's guitars generated more than 21.5 million in donations from people around the world. Money was a crossover hit, it climbed to number 13 on the Billboard Hot 173, it was not released as a single in the UK because the UK pundits would accuse Pink Floyd of selling out. Man. Number one. Time, another masterpiece from Dark Side of the Moon. Time is a monument to the lost art of conceptualism. You just don't find that kind of scrupulous and inspiring art in today's music recording process. David Gilmour's full-bodied vocal performance is a shining moment, among many shining moments in his superlative uh, career. I'm just I'm especially enthralled by Gilmour's delivery in the second verse of Time. And you run and you run to catch up to the sun, but it's sinking. Racing around to come up behind you again. The sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older, shorter of breath, and one day closer to death. Shorter of breath, 
The way Gilmore punctuates the word death in the lyric is a heating warning about our mortality. Time is not your friend if you waste it and toil it with no plan or purpose. Man, time will be over before we know it. It's a heavy tune, heavy tune. Somber lyrics by Roger Waters and a harrowing uh, arrangement charted by the entire band and production team that created Dark Side of the Moon. In addition to the absorbing captivation, David Gilmour's vocals on time and his towering guitar riffs. We must acknowledge the vocal lead on the bridges sung by the late Rick Wright. Along with his harmonies with David and special praise of the soulful backing vocals, Doris Troy, Leslie Duncan, Barry St. John, and Liza Strike. Every little detail on Dark Side of the Moon is stunningly effectual and grandiose. We at Professor of Rock are acutely aware of the rift between Pink Floyd's two legendary principals, Roger Waters and David Gilmour. Let me make it clear that we really honor both of them. Waters and Gilmour are brilliant, otherworldly artists, and the complexity of their proud, willfully strong personas is a big part of what makes them so extraordinary. Pink Floyd would not be the historic band that they are without the combination of these two rock giants, David Gilmour and Roger Waters, or without the invaluable contributions of Nick Mason, Richard Wright, or the mercurial genius, Sid Barrett. This episode has been dedicated to the exalted voice of David Gilmour. However, we will definitely produce a feature paying tribute to the preeminent Roger Waters in the near future. Until then, Let's savor the, the celebration of Mr. David John Gilmore, CBE, as one of the greatest vocalists of the rock and roll era. Leave us a comment about David Gilmore and Pink Floyd. What is your Gilmore fiber and why? What are your thoughts? What are your memories that are part of all of these songs and Pink Floyd? Now you can get Pink Floyd and other music by them and their merch below by clicking on our Amazon links. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. If you want more content like this, more videos, more interviews, become a patron to help us curate the history of the rock here and help us keep the music alive. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe.